We continue our story about the growth of country and western music by considering how it is that Nashville, Tennessee became the uh, home of country and western music after 1945. How the popularity of country and western music grew to the point where there could be one city that brought together both country and western music together under one umbrella. Uh, we'll, we'll think about that in this particular video. Uh, probably the place for us to start with thinking about how country and western came together as an industry in Nashville is to think, as we do with pop music, about radio exposure. Now, radio exposure for country and western music is different from the way it was for mainstream pop. With mainstream pop, that was exposed on the radio because it was the music of the mainstream culture and so when there was music on the radio it was mainstream pop music or classical music but it mostly was not country and western music and it almost never was rhythm and blues music that was not thought of as music that was particularly appropriate to be played um, much on, um, on, on regular network radio so if I say country and western music gets its exposure through radio what can I possibly mean if I just got done telling you that it hardly ever got on the radio well what happened, as I said a, a, a little bit in one of the previous lectures, I said something about these super stations. And the way super stations work in early radio licensing, you know, when they were figuring out how much territory you could cover with your radio station, if you're, you're broadcasting at this frequency, how high a power you can broadcast at, and all that kind of thing, there were certain kinds of deals that were made. And one of the deals that were made was, while the sun is still shining, stations can broadcast at a certain power level so they're not covering each other. Because you've got two stations on the same frequency, if they're not far enough away from each other, they'll start to bleed into each other and listeners won't be able to hear either one or they'll go back and forth between the other. So they had to work all this stuff out. So what they did is, they, everybody got to broadcast during the day, but in the evening, certain stations were allowed to crank up the power. And when they cranked up the power, the other stations that were on the same wavelength had to crank down their power so they wouldn't get in the way. So in the evening, there would be stations in a, in a world before cell phones and satellite transmissions when there weren't a whole bunch of signals bouncing around through the air. You could take one of these stations and it could broadcast, you know, up to five, six hundred miles away from where it was and cover a significant swath of the country. Well, it turned out one of those stations was WSM in Nashville, Tennessee. And they developed a show, a music show, that was uh, important to people who lived in Nashville, Tennessee, called the Grand Ole Opry. And that show, when it played uh, 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 evenings on the weekend, could be heard all around. My father grew up in uh, just south of, 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 of Pittsburgh, and he, uh, he talks about being able to get uh, the Grand Ole Opry in from WSM when he was growing up um, back in the, uh, the late 1930s. And so this is, this is fantastic. These super stations are able to distribute this music all around regions of the country without having to use the network uh, radio to do that. Another uh, big one of these was, uh, was a station called WLS in Chicago that had a show called National Barn Dance. Well, it turned out this music started to get a little bit more popular, and so you could get a short show, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, on one of the big networks. In fact, it was the Chicago show, the National Barn Dance, that first got onto NBC in syndication for, uh, I think it was 30 minutes in 1933. So you could actually now hear a little bit of country music, kind of as a novelty thing, uh, maybe once a week on NBC. By 1939, NBC was covering the Grand Old Opry. And it wasn't too long before the Grand Old Opry came to be thought of as the country radio show you wanted to be on. So if you wanted to have a career in country and western music, you had to get on the Grand Ole Opry. You had to come to Nashville, Tennessee. So what ends up happening? You get a lot of people coming into Nashville, Tennessee, and so it's a convenient place to have a recording studio if you're doing country and western music. It's a, record, it's a convenient place to have a publishing house if you're a publisher who publishes these, these, these songs in country and western music. It's even a good place to have a guitar store or to be a booking agent, any of these kinds of things. So Nashville starts to become headquarters for country and western music, mostly because so many of the top musicians are coming through to perform on the Grand Ole Opry. Now we pick up um, a, a story that we, we left off from one of the other videos um, about how constructing, how you can construct images. And it's fairly well agreed, I think, among scholars who study the history of country and western music, that the image of the Grand Ole Opry was 
pretty much constructed to represent what people thought of country music or country people of the day. That is, that no matter what these people who participated in the Grand Ole Opry were actually like in real life, when they were on stage, they kind of played the rube. They kind of um, played it down. They played into almost a caricature of what country life was. So you had people like Minnie Pearl, who would come out to do her comedy bit, and she would be wearing a very fancy hat, but on the fancy hat, would, the price tag would still be hanging there. And of course, it was important that not only knew that she had the hat, but how much she paid for it, because that showed how highfalutin she was. But of course, by having the, the tag hanging there, you knew that she was definitely not highfalutin. And it was that irony that they played on somebody who's so silly that they think they can impress somebody by leaving the price tags on their clothing. when they were. This is the kind of thing. And of course, I'm sure that when Minnie Pearl went out in the evening after the show was off, she you can go out in hats that had price tags hanging off them. Another one was a fellow by the name of Grandpa Jones, who if you look at old videos of the, of the Grand Ole Opry, ones that you can see even from the late 40s and early 1950s, it's clear that Grandpa Jones is only about 35 years old. He's wearing a false wig, he's got his hair straight, he's wearing a, wig, a, a, a false beard and a, and a wig and this kind of thing, and he's playing the role of a cranky old banjo playing grandpa, but he's basically playing that part, not unlike Mark Hamill playing Luke Skywalker in the first story. Star Wars. He's playing the role of Grandpa Jones, playing to this idea of the Rube. And this is what the Grand Ole Opry specialized in, constructing this image of country music as being a particular kind of thing, projecting this image. And it was very, very effective at doing so. But there are other ways that uh, country and western music came to be popular in this country besides the radio. Um, one of them has to do with the fact that a lot of people were thrown together in the Second World War who were from different parts of the country. And so you get people, you know, going into the South for basic training and guys from the North who are now bunking together with guys from the South and they're, they're talking about their lives and they're sharing their music. And a lot of guys, for the first time, were hearing country music um, that had never heard it before, and they started to like it. In fact, country music got so popular in the armed forces during World War II that Roy Acuff was voted the most popular singer in the armed forces uh, during one of those years. In fact, Jap Japanese kamikaze pilots used to, while they were crashing their plane into boats and things like that, say, uh, to hell with Roosevelt, to hell with Babe Ruth, to hell with Roy Acuff. Yeah, country singer. So it gives you an idea. People were starting to sort of embrace this music. And of course, when those northerners went back to their cities after they, they left the service and the war was over, if they developed a taste for that music, they wanted to hear it. And that's where the development of country music uh, in these urban areas it takes, it, it takes its foothold. Um, so Nashville becomes the central place after 1945, and as I said before, uh, that's mostly because of the Grand Ole Opry, and you've got your recording studios and your publishers and all these kinds of things sort of focusing in on Nashville. The most important publisher uh, of that era is, um, is um, a publishing house put together by Roy Acuff and a guy by the name of Fred Rose, who had been a New York publisher, but as the story goes, his wife was originally from Nashville, and so she wanted to move back to Nashville. So he moved back to Nashville with her and opened up a publishing business there. But of course, he had all of the advantage of having been in the business back in New York. So in many ways, this Acuff Rose publishing business uh, became one of the principal publishers in Nashville and brought a sense of the sort of New York music business sophistication to town uh, with it. They were very fortunate that the song Tennessee Waltz, which I mentioned a couple of videos ago from 1950, sung by Patti Page, was actually owned by Acuff and Rose. And so they earned a ton of money from the royalties that came with having that hit recording. And they were able to take that money and invest it in the business and grow it. Now, one of the things they were doing at about that time is signing songwriters. And one of the songwriters they signed um, in 1946, I think it was, was Hank Williams. Hank Williams has got to be seen in this period before 19, between 1945 and 1955 as the most important singer in country and western music. And through the fame of, country, of, of, of Hank Williams coming out of Nashville, it, all, it really plays a big role in solidifying Nashville as the um, as the, the home of country music. But Tank Williams is another one of these guys who had a very, very short time uh, in the sun from his first uh, re release in 1947 to his death in 1953. We're only talking about six years, but his songs have lived down forever. They're still being covered by country musicians and rock musicians even uh, to this day. Uh, so he was signed by Sa uh, Acuff Rose as a songwriter and not as a performer. In fact, his first song to come out on record was actually sung by another artist, a woman by the name of Molly O'Day. 
day. But by 1947, he had his own record out, a song called Move It On Over. In 1948, he appeared on a, a show just like the um, Grand Ole Opry, but uh, originating from Shreveport, Louisiana, called the Louisiana Hayride. A couple years later, a young Elvis Presley would be featured on the Louisiana Hayride, also at the Grand Ole Opry. Some of his important tunes, uh, the, the, w as we look back at Hank Williams, uh, Your Cheatin' Heart and Cold, Cold Heart sort of show Hank in the mode of romantic anguish, thinking about how uh, he's uh, anguishing over a woman in a romantic relationship. Hey, Good Lookin', which is one filled with confident sort of sort of a country version of confident excitement and a sort of in prayerful testimony we hear him with I saw the light reinforcing the kind of church traditions that have always been part of a country life and so Fr Hank Williams we really have to think of as um, that guy who was the first big Nashville star of country music Jimmy Rogers again from the, the late 20s early 30s and Hank Williams from the late 40s early 50s very very important figures one last figure we should talk about and I'm sorry we haven't got more time to talk about this is the birth of bluegrass music. Very rarely in the history of music are we able to say we know exactly where a style started and exactly who started it. But in this case, we almost do. Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys were essentially the beginning of bluegrass music in popular music. And even though bluegrass sounds like it's a music that goes way back to the beginning of time, it was actually kind of developed in the period after 1945. It sounds like it goes way back, but it actually doesn't in many ways. It's music that's, that's, that emphasizes acoustic instruments, no drums. In fact, there were no drums without the Grand Ole Opry for a long time. So you've got mandolin, you've got banjo, you've got acoustic guitar, you've got fiddle, uh, and in fact there's just one microphone, there's a kind of shunning of technology. Oftentimes th they'll add extra measures while the different soloists come to the, uh, come to the microphone. There's a little bit of extra sort of walking time that's, that's figured into the music so everybody can get in front of the microphone. Uh, in many ways bluegrass music, I as old as it sounds, is kind of the bebop jazz of country and western. It's where the players go who really want to show off their ability to solo, to be able to play virtuosically. And so it's important that in the late 40s when the bluegrass boys make the their first recordings, um, Earl Scruggs, the banjo player, is sort of the star soloist of that group. Earl Scruggs and that banjo playing that he does, that five-string five banjo playing, becomes really the emblematic sound of bluegrass music even today. Um, also in that group is Lester Flatt. After they played, after Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs played with Bill Monroe for a while, they, they started their own group and that's really where they had most of their fame as Flatt and Scruggs. If you want to listen to a great bluegrass piece, if you've got time for only one piece of bluegrass music, I would look for Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys, Blue Moon of Kentucky for 19, for, from 1947. That also has a great connection to the chorus because one of the first songs released by Elvis Presley on Sun Records in 1954 was his own version of Bill Monroe's Blue Moon of Kentucky. <laughs> 